bills are most responsible. I'm Morgan. And my last name is Carol. C A R R O L L. Hi, And I can get you. Uh, let me get you this. Hey guys. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. If you want one uh, to take down. Um, so we'll, we may have some other folks uh, join us. I'll go ahead and get us started since I know time's limited on a Saturday. Um, so briefly, by way of introduction, I'm Morgan Carroll. I'm a state senator right now for Aurora. Um, I am a candidate who has filed to run for the 6th Congressional District in Colorado. And something that's been important to me ever since I started. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Well, it'll just take, take a minute. I messed up making a card. Oh. <laughs> Where we have library I business got a new to card. see, too. Because <laughs> if I don't fix it, I'll never see her. You were again. Right, right, right. <laughs> By the way, support our local library. Yep, yep. Okay, here's this one. That's that. This one will work. Okay. Sorry about that. That's Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Here, Thank give you. you the pen back. Okay. Nope, and I'll, I'll sign it with my own pen. Thank you so much. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> okay. Um, so, what I found uh, at the state level is sometimes you start off with an idea of what you think the biggest priorities are of what you're going to work on. And by checking in with people, sometimes you realize that there's whole other areas that need to be addressed and different priorities. And so it's just, uh, it's a good process for me to help learn a little bit more about what kind of issues might be on your mind. Um, so briefly by background, I've been in the state legislature for 11 years. I'm our past president of the Colorado State Senate, past majority leader of the Colorado State Senate and basically started doing public service work because I've been an advocate my whole life. I'm a strong believer in people's rights and liberties. Um, I was part of a mother-daughter law firm with my mom for 10 years where we got to pick exactly the kind of cases and issues and people that we wanted to help. And you start to realize that sometimes the law itself is the problem uh, and can create whether you have an equitable and just society or one with barriers that are needless is an important place for law and policy. And uh, that meant that the job at the state legislature has been really, really rewarding. Uh, over 11 years, we've had, I'll just give you a little bit of my opinion, but there are some things that Colorado does right that I think that Washington, D.C. could learn from. Uh, we balance our budget every year. We have a single subject requirement, so you don't have things like unrelated writers Thank you. that tag on bills. Yeah. And the nice thing is, not everyone does it, but with single subject, there's no excuse not to be reading every single bill that comes through. And you'll find a lot of times at the federal level that, you know, these may be thousands of pages long, and it's not a given that everybody's, uh, that everybody's necessarily read everything. Mm -hmm. Hillary? Um, so, to me, uh, Colorado has a constitutional right for, uh, it's an obligation really, to have a public hearing on every bill. Every bill must be heard. The public has the right to testify for or against. Many states and in D.C. it's by invitation only. Mm -hmm. So there's some process things that I think we can learn from a good part of Colorado's experience and take some of these types of reforms, I think, to D.C., including single subject, issues, transparency, pub improving public participation in the process. Um, you know, things don't always come out perfectly, but almost without fail, anytime we've had citizen participation and input, our finished product has been better because of it, because without it, it's really just a paid lobby core of people that are lobbying on legislation. And so, in my view, people are the only check and balance, truly, um, to pay paid interests kind of taking that over. So um, that's a little bit of the background on, on uh, stuff that's there. Um, a decision to look at the 6th Congressional dis, uh, 
seat and run really came down to the fact that I feel like our country is at stake. I am deeply concerned about a new type of dysfunction becoming normal. Um, that things like shutdown are now a regular part of our vocabulary or defaulting on debt. Um, and that we're willing to play politics with things like national security, nuclear security. Even 20 years ago, this isn't uh, something that I would have recognized, uh, even within the healthy discourse of differences of ideas. Um, it, it, to me, seems destructive and very dangerous. And so at some point, I either had to decide that I'm OK with the direction the country's going in, or I'm not. <laughs> So um, I'm Morgan Carroll, that's a little bit of my background and uh, why I'm taking a look at it, but the more important part of today is I wanted to go around and just, if you wouldn't mind, tell me who you are. Um, if you want to pass, if it's uncomfortable for you, that's okay, but if, if you want to tell me what you are, uh, your name, and if there's anything you in particular would like to see improved at the federal level, that. Pretend for a moment that your government actually represented you. <laughs> what would they be working on right now? <laughs> um, and that is an incredibly valuable uh, feedback for me to get. And I don't know if you want to go ahead and start us off? Sure. Thank you. I'm Jan Harris. I live in Aurora. I'm an East Coast transplant, but I've been here 30 years this year. So I kind of adopt Colorado. I'm not going anywhere else. And um, my job disappeared last year, but it was time. So I now, uh, I always voted every election, but and I served as an election judge when okay. they used to do that at yeah. the polls, but that's as much as I could do. And I, I feel like I'm a newbie to the process. Well, welcome. Um, and I appreciate the information I've gotten so far, so I'm happy to be here. Well, that's great. Uh, do you mind telling us what kind of job went away? Um, I was a finance and administration manager for a nonprofit. Okay. And actually, I served in the nonprofit sector my whole time here. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Anything in particular you'd like to see improved at the federal level? The list is too long. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty long. It is pretty long. You know, even for a newbie, I mean, I watch everything. So I'm more interested in hearing from everyone else's opinions. That's wonderful. Ted? Okay. I just came in. I'm Ted, I'm Ted Fritchell uh, from Cent Western Centennial. And uh, I'm a native of Colorado. But I've lived elsewhere. I'm also on the State Democratic uh, Central Committee. So uh, I've known Morgan uh, somewhat for some time. Uh, I, I don't know where to start either with the long list. I'm just glad to see you running. And um, well, one of the main things is the, the Supreme Court. Uh, ruling on, on Citizens United. Citizens United. United. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know how you would approach that to try to get rid of it because you're not a Supreme Court judge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe so something. We can know. talk about that a little bit when we go around, but other than getting the Supreme Court to reverse its clearly weird ruling, yeah. <laughs> um, there is a congressional process with enough votes on ratification um, that could basically legislatively overrule it. It's, it's uh, more complicated and has some higher hurdles than some straightforward legislation, but there could be a congressional path to overturning Citizens United. Um, so that is, um, I will flag that issue, and then also we can do this however you want as far as talking about it as we go, but maybe if we let everyone else go around and then we can just have a wide open conversation about everybody's issues, then um, that's a great start, Ted. So we're just, introduce your name and if there's anything you'd like to see improved at the federal level or any issues you'd like to see, if, if you could have Congress do anything that you'd like them to do, what might they be doing now? How much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, I think we've got We can do something. Something, just period. Other than shut the government down. <laughs> My name's Mary Kay. I live here in Centennial. Great. Right. Um, boy, a long list. I would say, as it relates to Colorado and surrounding states, the area of great importance is water. Mm -hmm. yeah. Water in the land, conservation, and, and good management. And there's definitely a big federal role for both. Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, there absolutely. Is. Okay, great. Robert. I'm Robert. I 
like these two women, Centennial. In fact, I live right across the street. Oh. <laughs> That's why we picked this. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm glad because meetings are never here. I always have to travel. <laughs> and I can't do that today because somebody wrecked my car two days ago. So I'm glad that I didn't have to travel. Um, I'm also a Colorado native, and a long time ago, before most of the people in this room were born, I served in the legislature. Um, and I've been involved in politics since I was 12 when John Kennedy's motorcade came past my school. Mm. And I got to go out and shake his hand. So, uh, in McCarroll Brand, the first time for a brief period of time, I was living in Aurora. And in her first campaign, I had the opportunity to vote for her. And um, I watched her in action down at the, at the state legislature and totally impressed, not just with the issues that she champions, but how well she championed them. Unlike everybody else, we don't have enough time for me to talk about all the issues I think the government needs to address, but I think she summed it up. Just doing something would be a big change because Congress has done nothing since the Republicans took control a few years ago. And um, so anything would be better than nothing, except that if they did something, it would probably be disastrous. So. Yeah. Um, Citizens United is an issue. Just money and campaigns is a big issue for me. Climate change in the environment is a huge issue. It's a very serious issue. Um, income inequality is a big issue. Um, unfairness of women making less than men is a big issue because it goes to the whole income inequality thing. Um, children, and again, part of the problem with income inequality is the kids that suffer, or the children, um, those are issues. I could go on and on and on about about issues, and I'm concerned about all of this um, uh, warmongering that seems to be going on in Congress all the time. That, that there's not a single issue they don't want to have a war over. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can change that pattern. Great. I second all those motions. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back and uh, pick up the folks who joined us uh, on a second pass. So go ahead. My name is Joanne. I've been here only 40 years, so I'm kind of a newcomer. Newcomer, yeah. <laughs> and um, I've worked for over 40 years for either local or federal or somebody's government. So uh, I have a different view than if you're running your own business. I'm from Kansas, so I have a different view anyway. <laughs> <laughs> About <Shut> Colorado? So when I and I'm very interested in history, so when I read history, I always think, huh, I don't remember this from when I was taught history. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even remember uh, the Jewish problem in Germany. Uh-uh, we never heard of it. Hmm. In no. yeah. So uh, it was a whole different way of thinking about it. And every time I go back, I think about all of those things. Oh, okay, well. My issues are families, women, and children, and daycare. I just, two weeks ago, or a month ago or something, I got paid $240 for taking care of three children for one day. They were all lovely children, and I read a book most of the day, except when I went to the park and some lady tried to hire me. <laughs> Take care of her grandchildren. <laughs> no, no, you missed that. No, uh -uh. but it's outrageous. Two hundred and forty dollars a day. When's yeah. her phone number? <laughs> <laughs> I know um, it is private. Expensive. Yeah. <laughs> it is really expensive. I'll just add very briefly. You know, my brother and his wife. They have four kids between them. And they each had two jobs apiece, and one of their four jobs was for nothing but child care. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one whole job was for nothing but child care. So wow. it's just been really expensive. Well, I'm also an advocate for excellent child care and mm -hmm. work for the university doing research on providing excellent infant and early childhood care. So. Uh, there's all kinds of sides to that, but it needs to be looked at. It does. Great, thank you. My name is Mahavashkaram. I live everything to my daughter. Thank you. Okay. 
We can add. It's not now or never. We can always go back. Welcome, Lori. Good to see you. Hi, I'm Lori Edelman. I live in unincorporated Arapahoe County. Um, I think probably one of the top of mind issues for our family is I have two nephews in middle school, and we're looking at college. Mm. And uh, how can we help them? How can we look at um, having them not graduate? With, with a very large debt load. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably the, the thing that's closest for us right now. Um, and I would say one of the other things, even though there are many, it's a very long list, um, is immigration. <coughs> so um, i kind of like to hear your thoughts on something other than a brick wall. <laughs> um, <laughs> two that's brick not, walls. <laughs> two brick walls, which you know are actually not necessarily um, the primary problems. So, yeah, um, yeah. Um, those are good. I'll just um, briefly put in two thoughts. Um, the federal government has a role not only on college affordability, but specifically, as you know, on student loans and student debt. And while at the state level, you know, I I helped on the bill to cap tuition, and we tried, and many were defeated in the Senate as far as dealing with student debt. But the bigger driver of that is actually federal. And so Congress can, does, and should have a role on addressing that. So for example, the interest rate that we uh, have students borrowing from is so much higher than what we loan to banks. Mm -hmm. And so if we can lend to banks at, say, 1%, <coughs> uh, yeah, right? Like, we don't need to go into debt, but it shouldn't be a profit-making proposition on student loans and so to me I feel like when you look at all of the debt that's out there compounded over time one of the very significant things that the federal government could choose to do differently is just simply give students the same rates they get banks when lending and when you look at all the principal debt that's out there compounded over time um, it would actually put a very significant debt uh, as well as maybe some selective loan forgiveness and we can talk about it a little bit more later but you know for a while there really was starting to get some traction on a left-right coalition on immigration reform uh, one thing I can tell you from just my time walking district in Aurora uh, there's almost nobody who doesn't think that the immigration system is broken right. um, and that it, and many people don't realize exactly how broken it is until you look at how long wait lists are and mm -hmm. quotas and that if someone were to literally go through and follow the rules now, that they might have to be separated from their children for 30 years before they get reunified. It's very arbitrary depending on what country you're coming from. And so if you ever think that the federal government can be plagued with bureaucracy and red tape, the immigration system is, makes the tax code look simple. <laughs> um, and so I do think we need a pathway to naturalization for family reunification. There's so many things yeah. we could do. I mean, we've done a DREAM Act at the state level. There's been one introduced. 
All of these things have bipartisan support, but the leadership isn't letting them get voted on and go to the floor. So I'll just do a little placeholder there and tell you yes. <laughs> there is definitely a few things that Congress could be doing on that front. Um. I'm Pierce. I'm actually from the North Metro area, uh, and I'm a video tracker for the NRCC. Um, and actually, like, I do have kind of a issue I would be curious about is um, reducing military spending and what your thoughts on that would be. So the budget you're seeing right now as part of the shutdown is something that um, seems to come with greater complications getting it done at the federal level. Um, the um, Colorado just had a base realignment and closure study that was done to take a look at at least Colorado's installations their impacts on the different local economies uh, for what are going on there. Um, and even though the federal government doesn't have the same balanced budget requirement, clearly there's a trade-off of choices. So I think no, no one of these issues by themselves can be looked in isolation. We need to look at priorities as far as education, roads, infrastructure, <coughs> defense spending, diplomacy spending, uh, as well as defense spending. Um, so I think basically the whole budget is obviously one of the biggest lifts that has to be done federally and like the state budget, it has to reflect our values for what's in there and any piece is going to be looked at as kind of a trade-off against what else you might be uh, spending in that as well. I guess what we're doing is identifying ourselves. Introduce yourself and let me know what, uh, what top <laughs> issue or issues you'd like to see improved upon at the federal level. <laughs> Uh, all of them. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Your problem is? <laughs> My name is Don Schiff. I'm a retired pediatrician. I live in Littleton. I'm a precinct committee man and have been an active Democrat for uh, 70 years, I guess. Um, I guess the range of issues that I'm interested in start with anything related to children and health. But then beyond that, of course, it goes on to global warming and to Iran and nuclear arrangements. And I could go on for a long time, but I think that's enough to start with. Okay. That's great. Thank you. I'm sure you've talked about all this already. Not all of it, no. Okay. We haven't talked about Iran yet, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the elephant in the room, right? Um, I'm Barbara Roop. I live in Aurora. And... Um, I guess, as everyone said, everything. Uh, Citizens United is a biggie. Um, and lobbying, being able to control or get rid of a lot of the lobbying in Washington, I think, is so detrimental to our political system. Um, again, it's like what you called said, um, you know, best government that people can buy, you know, and that that is a biggie. And the... Um, Part of the health care system which says that Medicare cannot negotiate drugs. Yes. That's a huge, huge, huge. I mean, it's costing, you know, they have such a problem with the expenses of Medicare and Social Security and all of that. <clears throat> but when we can't negotiate pricing on things, it's just, you know, it just negates whatever else you might be able to save somewhere else. So that's a biggie. That's a huge one. Yeah. I mean, and it is... As you point out, it's very, uh, there is no other situation where you wouldn't rationally use your economies of scale to right. try and get cheaper prices. I mean, it's what a business would do, it's what any responsible government would do on behalf of taxpayers for what's there. And clearly, it's a good example, honestly, of where the pharmaceutical. That's where the lobbyists come in. You know, yeah. they don't want negotiated oh lower God. prices no. for what's there. Morgan, would you start all over? <laughs> <laughs> Way to make us flash. We, we haven't taped here in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, that's a it's a really yeah. good point. What and part I of Utah all the in. <laughs> we are in Utah, part of Utah. Welcome. Um, I I would just say on quick follow up on the lobbying um, piece of that. Um, I think Colorado is in um, better shape in many ways than DC. But even then, um, when I first came in in the House, um, and some of you may have gone uh, far enough back with me on that to know, but one of the first bills I introduced and passed was on lobbying reform. And you want to talk something that was unpopular in a bipartisan way, because I had colleagues on both sides of the aisle who 
hated this bill <laughs> because we had 1,100 paid lobbyists mm. who hated this bill. Mm. But we don't have anything like this at the federal level. And one of the things I would be interested in working on is, so what the state bill did is it took everyone who's a paid lobbyist, it updated the transparency of exactly who they are, who they work for, how much they're getting paid, and every single piece of legislation that is introduced in Colorado is now online at the Secretary of State's office. So we'll just call it, you know, Senate Bill 1. And you can see the fingerprints of everyone who is being paid to lobby for it or against it, who their clients are, and how much they're getting paid oh. to try and shape public policy. It's sobering and it's queasy, but when your, your antidote to that is to realize the power of citizen engagement and grassroots and realize, well, that is literally what we're up against. That's the type of reason why you don't <coughs> see negotiation no. on. So without transparency and exposure of it, it basically amplifies the power of that. Um, and so I personally would just offer quickly that I think there is enormous room for improvement at the federal level uh, because all those issues we had at the state level on lobbying reform, it is needed times 10 at the federal yeah. level, and it is certainly worth trying to do. Yeah, yeah. hi, Roger. Hi. <laughs> I'm the lesser half of Barbara. <laughs> uh, I'm Roger Roop, and I'm a precinct committee person in Precinct 443, which is in Heavy Gardens. Uh, I'm very excited about meeting Morgan. Uh, I've seen her briefly in the headquarters, but I haven't had an opportunity to really uh, listen to what you have to say. I'm very impressed. Um, I have a, also a long list of uh, topics to talk about, but the, I think the, the thing that scares me the most is that we have some conservatives in the Supreme Court who have never had to run for a political office using their very idealistic ideas of things and deciding that money should be the same thing as free speech. So some people have billions of free speeches, and some of us just have a few hundreds of free speeches. Uh, and that that is causing literally our, our whole system to be sold. Uh, if you were to walk, well, it's like in Texas. At one point, they had people that walk into the, the chamber of Congress, dump a pile of $30,000 on one of the legislators' desk to get his vote to make it so that the bill to limit pollution wouldn't pass. They were so offended with that, they said, you can't, you can't donate while Congress is in session. <laughs> okay, well, so as soon as they finish their session, then you can pile your money on their office desk, I guess. But it's, I, I look at the Koch brothers who are uh, donating hundreds of millions of dollars, and I've seen the th work that they've been doing where they literally have organizations that pack up the legislation, hundreds of pages of legislation. They hand it to a candidate along with a lot of money, say, propose that, and it shows up in the bills proposed in identical form. They are having <coughs> campaigns set up, uh, offices set up, uh, misinformation distributed, and that troubles me because that really attacks me. It, to me, it, it's attacking our, our country's character at the very roots. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. I'm Deborah Sampson. Um, I'm from Highlands Ranch. <laughs> Yay. Yes, there are a few of us there. Um, <laughs> and a few. <laughs> me and two others. But, um, I'm here because, um, as you know, I'm a, a volunteer advocate. Um, and I have watched you over the years in the legislature. I have been envious of the people you represent because I've seen you as um, a, considerate, a considerate person who really examines issues in an even-handed way. Um, and people in Highlands Ranch have never been represented by anyone like that. So um, I'm here because I think what, what I have seen of you in your work in the legislature is what we need in Congress. So that's why I'm here. Now, issues we can talk and talk and talk and you know <coughs> some of my issues because you've heard me talk about them in the legislative hearings. So 
And thank you for participating in those hearings, by the way. A lot of people It's don't. not easy, but it's much easier in Colorado than it yes. is in Congress. Yes, it is. Um, That's true. Yes, yeah. it is. Well, thank you for so. joining us today. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves and identify? Bob and Beth Barton, newcomers from Georgia, uh, Democrats for about 12 years. Um, from the east side of Morgan's. Oh my God, we live almost in, in Kansas. <laughs> She's from Kansas. I'm originally from Kansas too. My parents are from Kansas. <laughs> anyway, it's good to see all you, I uh, assume, Democrats. Uh, not necessarily. Mostly. Not necessarily. <laughs> Let me tell you how Morgan's going to win. We've done this in Georgia, and what we did was work together. You've all heard the, the excuse we used about herding cats, mm -hmm. baloney. Herding cats is nothing to it. What we beat them with, or what we are beating them with in Georgia, let me remind you, somebody mentioned uh, the Koch brothers, I believe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the Koch <laughs> brothers, the Koch brothers didn't have to spend any money for in Georgia. They could just take it for granted. The whole state was red. You know, why bother? The few Democrats that were there had paper bags on their heads, okay? Because they were intimidated. Go to church on Sunday. They'll hand you a paper to tell you how to vote. Right, right. You can't believe it, but please. We changed that. We changed that by group hug. <laughs> group hug outdoes money. Group hug means bringing people together to work together who believe in each other. If you believe it, you can achieve it. And that's what Morgan is all about. First of all, you've got to have an outstanding candidate. And we really do have one, okay? Second of all, we have to have the right attitude. Yesterday, uh, I was in a meeting, there were two counties involved, Adams and Arapaho. Uh -huh. Day before that, you were there, Morgan, there were three counties. Oh, wait a minute, I think that was the meeting you were in. And then yesterday, uh, a meeting with Adams County. Anybody here from Adams County? Okay. So we're starting to try to put people together to understand we're on one team. We're not herding cats in Arapahoe County. We're not fighting each other in Arapahoe County. We're going to pull together as a team. Team. T-E-A-M. I'm not saying committee. Committees, you know, those folks out there with those positions that say how important they are, but nothing gets done. Team means I take on accountability. I take on responsibility. I'm going to work together for one purpose. Let's hope. When the Broncos take the field next Sunday, they put a team on the field <laughs> and not a committee. <laughs> <laughs> so we're about group hunt. So all of us, let's work together and have the biggest group hunt uh -huh. in the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> all of us. By the way, it's easy to herd cats. You just have to have what they want. <laughs> <laughs> I was the mouth. Here's the brain. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad we waited for the call. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, <laughs> Did you want to add any issues that you want to you know, see? I think, you know, you pick up the Denver Post this the past week, and the big issue was the mining village into the environment yeah. of this state, and that's just horrifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they got the budget to do that years ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and this is this is the dance where uh, I mean, on one hand, it's easy to talk about sort of cutting regulation, but what it means is oversight. And so we've seen at the local level, for example, when you don't have enough inspectors, the odds are that it waits till something catastrophic happens, and right. then everybody's worse right. off. Right. And those are state state paid inspectors. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, but by analogy, the same thing is true at the federal level. When they have oversight and inspections, they need to do that if their budget's held up, if you don't uh, basically provide proper oversight at that level, then things go to this you know, yep. escalated point and it becomes cataclysmic. And right. someone else had brought up water yeah. um, at, you know, earlier for what's there. And um, we've been sort of surprised because we've been in California, New Jersey, North Carolina, Georgia, and of all states that you would think, maybe they've just taken it for granted in this beautiful state. But those other states seem to be more focused on the environment than Colorado is. You know, it's interesting. Um, when you go around the state on statewide listening tours, which I did as part of the leadership, water is something that will cross party lines. 
And um, I think the awareness of water started more in our rural areas yeah, because it's m cool. most immediately tied to livelihoods. Right. And I think for a while in cities, it was too easy to go to a tap mm -hmm. and just sort of get disconnected on where it comes from. But I will say that the metro <coughs> areas have become far more proactive on right. water conservation uh, efforts that are out there. And, and that includes not only Aurora, but Denver. But they were almost late. Uh, to the table. If you go over on the western slope because they're so fearful yeah. of the front range doing water grabs yeah. on them, yeah. uh, it won't matter if they're a Democrat or a Republican. If you if you get anywhere near their water wanting to do a transbasin diversion, um, yeah. you better run. <laughs> <laughs> you better you, run. Yeah, the Did cities are see? buying farmlands and getting their water rights. Right. right. Did you see the, there was a documentary that I thought was pretty well done, the Great Divide, mm. that yeah. was done by Channel 9. Great. Okay. It's about an hour, it's a little over, I think an hour, an hour and a half long. But it was, it really, because for the first time, I've been in Colorado for probably, what, 25 years or more. But um, almost 30, no, more than that, 30, 35, 35 years. I was not aware of the history. They go into the history of where a lot of this started and why. And then you could start to understand the problems with the East you know, the east side and the west side. And That's a good suggestion. And yeah. by the way, um, before we move through, at the state level, Colorado is still working and debating over its uh, statewide water plan as well. So yeah. we do yeah. have a state, and it is every bit as lively and critical as it can be. And so, um, it was. It, yeah, if yeah. you want to uh, Google the Colorado water plan, there's draft proposals, and they did it by region and basin for what's there. Um, but it is not the kumbaya, mm -hmm. everyone's coming together on the same page, like water mm -hmm. never really is. And no. so if you're interested in seeing where that goes, uh, check that out. And it's just going to be worse. It's just going to get worse and worse. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tom Perot. I'm a lifelong Democrat. I live over at Orchard Gate, which is uh, uh, Orchard and Dayton, roughly. Um, I'm interested in lots of different things, but I'm actually I'm interested in, in alternatives to nursing homes at the end of life. I'm interested in more robust hospice care services, including inpatient hospice services besides exactly when you're dying, um, which is currently the way it's evolved. Yeah. It leaves particularly less people with less income with very few options at the end of life, mm -hmm. which is in, in prison reform, uh, elimination of capital punishment. The reason I, I'm up, the reason I say that uh, the minority Democrat is because I'm also the one third of Democrats who's pro-life. Mm -hmm. And so I was interested in hearing uh, where you stand as far as <coughs> whether you're willing to consider restrictions in abortion at the end, like late-term abortions and these kinds of things, because it looks like the last CNN Gallup poll, 51% of Democrats are in favor of restrictions upwards of 80% of Republicans and independents are somewhere in the middle, 60 to 70 percent. So taking extreme position on abortion rights undermines your political stature from my perspective in this county, and I'm just curious if you know, where you stand in that regard. Um, well, you've covered from uh, the beginning to the end and everything in between, uh, pretty much for what's there. Um, I would just say, uh, briefly that there is both a federal and a state role as far as end of life choices and options and we haven't done a particularly good job most of our um, skilled nursing care is now in the hands of for-profit providers mm -hmm. so there really isn't much of a nonprofit or public sector support for end of life uh, and, and advanced skills that are needed and so I think what a lot of people face is um, there's a couple different phases where we could look at this where I actually do think that there's policy decisions to be made here. I think what a lot of people experience, like what my own dad experienced, is that he worked, he saved, he retired, he was frugal, and then you basically spin down in a private for-profit hospital until you run out of money, and then it kind of does this force spin down into poverty as people age, and then you're on Medicare and Medicaid and, and nursing home there. And it was difficult to get in-home care services. The way state and federal government can help improve autonomy for choice for people, besides choices, I mean, there's 
is there public sector skilled um, retirement <coughs> care or skilled nursing care that could be provided? Yes, if we chose to make that a priority. But we also, through how we uh, set up our reimbursement rates, wind up shifting and skewing the whole system as to whether we really provide the in-home care options that for a lot of people they might wind up being institutionalized sooner than they might actually need it because they don't have the in-home care support they need and if they did um, people could stay relatively independent for a much longer period of time and so yeah. there's absolutely no reason that we can't scale services to be everywhere from minimal to fairly intensive as long as possible in people's home and frankly do it at less cost, which is what we saw at the state level where it's actually even intensive in-home services in many, many cases is still actually less cheaper yeah. Yeah. Uh, than doing an institutionalized route. Okay. So I think at the federal level we're looking at reimbursement rates on that. I think at the state level we've done some movement on the margins within what we can at Tabor there. but. The failure to basically make a menu of options available <coughs> and make the reimbursement structure match what people need in their homes um, has the net effect of cutting off options uh, for people as they age who might need a little bit of help, um, but um, you know, getting the in-home might be difficult. Um, for me personally, I guess I would say that I think a decision of what a woman does with her body is between her and her doctor. And I would not want to criminalize women or physicians, nor would I want the government to be in there to, how do you regulate the late term? That means someone else is coming into your medical records for the potential of criminal prosecution. And what people want to do with their choices, I think, I think very few people actually would choose to do a late-term abortion, um, but by the time, I'm just not comfortable with having any outside party <coughs> breaching a doctor-patient relationship for what's there. And I do think that where we had for a while some promise in making some movement with other folks in a pro-life movement was on contraception and prevention, and for a while we were seeing things and then that got politicized a bit too, but we had a really successful program in Colorado that cut uh, abortion rates down by a third. Mm -hmm. And for a while, it wasn't particularly politicized. And what was happening on the data is we saw a drop in teen, and we saw a drop in teen pregnancy. Uh, we saw a reduction of people going on to public assistance for what was there. And so it felt like a win-win because you weren't, um, you weren't basically using government to intervene on people's bodies or their <coughs> health care, but at the same time we were in fact seeing a measured and proven reduction uh, in abortion rates. Um, I have heard too much testimony from people in fairly tragic and horrible, and this is at the state legislative level with people coming forward with profoundly complicated medical stuff coming up late term that I just didn't feel qualified to come in and second guess someone, someone else was going. I mean I had a woman who is, I thought took great courage to come forward and testify on this, and they discovered late term that basically almost the entire brain uh, of the child was missing. Uh, and it would have died, and so basically the alternative was to force birth, uh, to not only a stillbirth, but even with equipment, they weren't sure they were gonna keep it alive, and it was a big debate, and it was sort of their family, and it was late term, and they didn't detect it early, and I don't know what decision each family would make. Some might say, you know, I feel strongly, I want to go ahead and, and have this child. And, and for them, it was just forcing tragedy on tragedy. Um, when I've heard things like that, I honestly just don't feel comfortable saying that a one-size-fits-all, like you couldn't do that. Yeah, I, mean, I guess to that point, you know, pre you're probably aware that there's perinatal hospice services now available for the fetuses that are yeah. in that situation and provides more support to the mother and the family than going in an abortion and then you're left on your own. Yeah. It's actually much more enriched, caring, compassionate service for those kinds of families. But it turns out that most of the late term abortions aren't related to those kinds of fetal anomalies. They're, you know, there's between 200 and 450 that occur in Colorado each year, for instance. Most of them are not fetal anomaly related. Warren Hearn has performed abortions up to 38 weeks, which is, as you know, full term. 
And so what you're saying is there's no time frame <coughs> you think that the rights of the fetus are competing with the rights of the mother. And there's absolutely no time to, until it passes the vaginal canal that you think that, it, that it deserves any protections. I really trust women to know what's best for their own bodies. I do. I think, I think that stance, I mean, even though it, I don't know what your polling says, but I think that stance will hurt you in this, in this election. Okay. Morgan, could I say something? Yeah. I just read a report from J.P. Morgan on the economy. And um, my whoever, what do you call the guy who does your money anyhow, he shows me this report. The fastest growing segment of our economy is health care. Having had my mother in a nursing home, for five years, I believe it. And I'll give you an example of that. I don't want to get to the abortion thing. I'll give you an example of that, though. My mother was about every three months sent to the hospital until my brother and I met in her room one day after she was found standing up in the middle of the hospital room, blood all over her, nobody taking care of her because she decided to get out of bed at that point. She had Alzheimer's. Why was she in the hospital? And why weren't they watching her? I'm a nurse. I'm a physician too, sir. So. Yeah. I'm well, with that my brother and I had a very loud discussion <coughs> in the room this, the next day with me telling him she had better not ever be in that hospital again. She lived four more years because they took better care of her in the nursing home. Nursing homes are for nursing care. She did not need medical care. She needed to be taken care of in the nursing home. She lived four years, no more pneumonia, no more hospitalizations. And it isn't, I think both ends of this have to do with money. And that's why we're the fastest, it's the fastest growing segment of the economy. And that's why it's so important we solve some of these issues. Yeah. Um, so we've almost met everybody, and then we'll everybody open it up too. for well, we've got a couple of folks that we're here too. I'm Robert Sampson, part of the part of Deb. <laughs> anyway, I, one of my th things I'd like to see is the this uh, ongoing thing about government is evil, we should do away with government, we shouldn't spend taxes. But, you know, if you don't spend money on things like science research and healthcare research, the benefits for that, that, you know, like the space program, we spent huge amounts of money, but it spun off huge things that are still uh, affecting the economy of this country and the world. And now uh, not funding transportation, we got a third world railroad system for public transportation and trying to do it way with the EPA so we want to go a lot of these policies are you know, putting us back we on the road to being third world countries yeah. in terms of like the environment and and other things financial oversight that kind of stuff and then, uh, then the other thing is this ongoing thing of, of uh, trying to eliminate as many voters that are opposed to your views of the, all the legislation and making it difficult to vote is in you know that so much of it we want to prevent, prevent voter fraud and oh you can find a handful of cases some and most times it's the other party that's, <laughs> that's doing the fraud and they're the ones that are trying to eliminate any of this stuff there's whole lots of stuff that uh, yeah um, so there's a, a lot in that. Um, transportation at this point for the state of Colorado, for example, is mostly federal pass-through funds. We have no line item in the state budget for it. And uh, <laughs> for those of you, um, you know, you're just reminding me about the investment that, for example, FDR, um, there have been whole eras of economic stimulus that have come investing into infrastructures that we are now aging out of. And it's not only our highway system, it's uh, plumbing, it's phone lines, and frankly, we, uh, you know, if we're ever going to get modern on broadband, I think it's going to take an equivalent vision 
just like it did actually really for Eisenhower on a highway system in the 1950s. Um, and we've had some efforts state by state on that, but it makes it very spotty, and you don't have to do anything other than go to different parts of Colorado to see like how, how spotty that is. Um, science funding and research, I would just underscore, is a very big federal issue, funding through the National Institutes of Health. Um, this has a huge economic impact for our Anschutz Research Centers that we have here, a lot of Colorado companies and businesses are tied to this as well, <coughs> but as we've reduced public funding in science and research, it has pushed more research and development into private sector pharmaceutical companies who then patent, and then when you're looking at the area of drugs, if they do find something, they sort of have that patented ability for a legal monopoly for a long period of time, which keeps the cost of drugs up. So whereas, just to give a small example, Let's say it was research being done at CU at the Health Sciences Center, and if they were doing antibiotic research uh, resistant, antibiotic resistant research there, in a public institution, it's a publicly held, you wouldn't have the patent uh, for what's going forward, and suddenly it goes to market at a much cheaper price, and it's the space program, it's health research, it's cancer research, um, and we happen to have a lot of very good, decent paying jobs that are, you know, orbits to healthcare related p positions that are around research funding. We do a little bit at the state level, um, but right now, I, this is a, but one example of what gets held up when we've got the government shutdowns that are always around in, in the budget where uh, there's a real risk that we continue to um, cut funding and in the short term on science research you might think you're saving money. But long -term. but long term, right? I mean, it's uh, it's the discoveries you're not making. It's the research that's not getting done, and it's either not getting done or you're putting it so it's done in private hands, and then it's going to make the costs just really high. Or, or the discoveries are made in a foreign country, and we don't get to benefit. Right. Also, the a lot of the spending goes to help edu to education, yeah. to to uh, fund graduate students and undergraduates and all that. <coughs> That's it's big. Um, one thing on voting, um, before we go through it there too, most voting laws, most of them actually are state, but the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was part of the Civil Rights Movement, and the, as well as um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act is now under attack at the federal level. I just want to be clear about that, that we've seen some weakening at the courts, <coughs> Uh, there may, in fact, be a legislative will at the federal level to uh, weaken the Voting Rights Act, which was really coming at things like poll taxes, barriers in response to, mm -hmm. even since post-Reconstruction you know, post -reconstruction Civil War stuff, as a practical matter, um, the barriers to voting were still so pronounced that obviously there was a need for that. Um, Things have changed, but not to the point where the, the basic protections that were put in place to guarantee people's rights to vote have not become obsolete in the Voting Rights Act. And, and there have been, and you should just know and continue to know that there will be a push at the federal level to basically get that. So we do have to definitely watch that. Yeah. Uh, my name is Danielle Dalpe. I'm from Aurora, and um, I've been retired for three years. So one of my concerns is preserving Social Security. Um, that's not even being discussed very much anymore. And so much money has been taken out for years to fund other programs. So um, I'm very concerned with that. Um, I'm also concerned with the uh, right to die with dignity. Um, I was disappointed that that bill did not pass. <coughs> and um, I'm hoping that can be proposed again. Uh, for Colorado, I would think that I would think Colorado would be a good state to get that to go through. Um, I'm also concerned with equal pay for women um, because I know I've worked over four years and got paid less <coughs> than um, men doing the same jobs did, and I want my granddaughters to get paid equally for their work. Um, and then the, I'm concerned with shutting down of, so, of Planned Parenthood um, because that does so much more than just abortions. That's, I would think, 
minimal compared to everything <coughs> else it does to prevent life, save lives. Uh, the screenings, the cancer screenings, and um, yeah. all types of things. And then um, <coughs> the Republicans want to shut that down. Uh, so uh, that is a big concern to me. And I'm so excited to meet Morgan. Anyone that's going up against Mike Kaufman, you've got my. <laughs> well, I, I worked on Andrew's uh, campaign, and it was heartbreaking to lose it by such a slim margin. Yep. So, um, teamwork. I'll help you. Teamwork. Was, was teamwork. Yes. Teamwork. <laughs> teamwork. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Okay, so you're up to me now? Yeah. Well, right, we missed you. So if we're skipping, it's because a couple folks came in after we started. Well, you're already gone, right? She sure has. All right, so it's your cool. turn. All right. I'm Snow Schaefer, and I'm a precinct committee person here uh, locally, and I uh, have 194, precinct 194. It runs from Dry Creek and University all the way up to uh, <coughs> Easter Avenue. I've got Tiffany and the Knowles, the two Knowles uh, townhomes down there. And so anyways, um, my issues uh, are specifically this. I am disabled <coughs> as well. And I agree with you that uh, you try to get a job and they go, ha, yeah, right, go away. So, you know, that's <laughs> the way life is, you know. And so in the meantime, um, In the meantime, I'm going to have to try to survive, try to find the money for food, groceries, bills like heating, electricity, you know, my son's in college. That's another issue because tuitions are insane mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you got to get the tuitions down, make public schools, uh, you know, out of them, get rid of all this private tuition. I, you know, I checked into DU for going there for one semester. One semester, forty thousand dollars. Wow, oh, cheap at half the price. You know, and CU and CSU um, and just all those. You know, it's like. And so, that's not even for law school. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, it's just right. one semester. You know, I mean, just think of four years of this, you know, oh my God. So, you know, I think that there definitely needs to be some help there, okay? But on the issue of Social Security, which I'm on, and Medicare, mm -hmm. I definitely want to see changes in the donut hole. Mm. You have got to get those prescriptions negotiated down and that donut hole filled because I have a prescription currently that during the beginning of the year, the uh, I was only, you know, charged thirty-five dollars for. It. Now that I'm in the donut hole, it's one hundred and eighty-five dollars. Guess what? That medication helps me breathe. Just kind of a slightly important medication, <laughs> I would think. And now it's one hundred and eighty-five dollars, <laughs> and so I can't do it. That's not the option. It's mm -hmm. either I pay for gas and food, or I pay for my prescription. Jesus. Yeah. You know, or I pay for the heat. Now I've got the heat turned off. You know, I've got the air conditioning turned off. Do you think that I'm going to turn it back on when it gets cold? <laughs> I probably can't afford it. So, the pay for disabled. And for uh, the retired, mm -hmm. guess what? It's not supposed to be a system where you're supposed to be depending on your retirement. Well, guess what? I didn't retire from my company. I got laid off. So I don't have a retirement. I had a 401, but guess what? I had to use that 401 money to pay off my debts because I don't make enough. Hello, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to get more money in for people that are on Social Security. How do you pay for it? How the hell do you pay for it? Raise the ceiling, okay? Raise the ceiling.
for who puts into the Social Security system. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, the Social Security system is not a giveaway. Free money for people who should get off of their fat asses and get to work. The Social Security system is something that we worked for. Remember the FICA tax? Hey, that's how we pay for Social Security, okay? So if we get more people in by raising the ceiling, we'll get more money put in. Yeah. Who knows if those people that make $200,000 a year later on down the road might get laid off, might run into homelessness, have to depend on the Social Security system, it would be wise for them to put in for it. Yep. And you know? all those are also things <coughs> between protecting Social Security, but making sure that people realize that people have paid into Social Security Hello. Uh, for their whole working lives and, and, and that don't and the apply. other the other thing is about the CPI index or the, the consumer price index. Okay. There's another campaign that's going around that uh, has the consumer price index enhanced edition, okay? Bull. All right, look, I took economics. I was thoroughly entrenched in economics, okay? I know how the system works, okay? And if you base uh, uh, things on a CPI index, it's basing it on consumer prices that people pay for everyday things, okay? And so if the market because that's that'll be in an essence market based. So you you have a market that fluctuates, okay? So say there's a fire or a drought and the vegetables go up. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that social security recipients would receive less because the consumer price index is going higher, so you have to pay them less. When it goes lower, then you pay them more. More. Yeah, there's been, anytime we're adjusting for some kind of inflation or cost of living, there's a very real debate to be had about, there's multiple indicators we could be using, and some of them are more and less accurate, <coughs> more or less equitable as we go through, and I think that's And, and another, another basis for uh, uh, some of this economic uh, stuff for, like, welfare recipients or uh, unemployment, uh, the unemployment actually is not based on anything except for the, the, uh, the companies, they pay for the unemployment insurance, okay, that's how that's derived. It's not a giveaway, it's not for somebody that's just out there trying to get some money free, and then the welfare recipients that receive money for food and uh, basic needs, okay, is based off of a grocery basket. And the grocery basket is what you buy at a grocery store. And you put it in your basket, basket and you take home. That's it. What about rent, daycare, gasoline, transportation, car payments, etc. Medical bills, you know. So that particular issue needs to be adjusted as well. Instead of doing a grocery basket, you have to take a look at an average of rents, mortgages, uh, daycare costs, whatever thing might be affecting their finances, and then give them an appropriate amount. Sounds How good. does that affect the economy? If you have more money in your pocket, which the Republicans say, hey, we need more money in our pocket, we need to cut we need to get get this less taxes thing out of our Oh look, that's not what makes more money in your pocket. The more money in your pocket is how much you come bring in and you have available to spend. Okay? And that goes back out into the economy. What money that you have to pay for the taxes, you're paying for services. You're paying for military protection, you're paying for NI, uh, the medical research, you're, you're paying for uh, Social Security, you're paying for the administration and such, and, and you're paying for all kinds of services, okay? And if, without those services, the roads, for instance, transportation, 
if all the roads were not fixed and you don't want to spend the money because you just don't want any of your taxpayer dollars going off to that, well, guess what? You got holes in the roads and bridges breaking down. There's one that Mike Kaufman has in his district uh, that's right off of uh, Dry Creek. And I know of exactly where it is. It's close to Parker Road. It's falling apart. We fix that, it every time it falls down. It, every time it falls down. <laughs> Well, so, you know, um, I just want to let guys know that we've got businesses suffering, and I want to let you finish here. I think we have one other person to hear from. I don't know how robustly they're going to kick us out, but I just wanted to flag that Probably technically we had till three. Oh, I was three. That was beyond three. We uh, we can stay a little bit longer. Okay. Okay. Great. Sorry. Go ahead. All right. So anyway, if the roads are all falling apart, okay, then businesses can't get their trucks with their goods and products shipped off to their businesses and then they can't sell them to the customers like refrigerators and couches and whatnot. I mean really what we need is first off a raise in minimum wage to get more money into the pocket, raise the social security benefits amount, uh, take this, the ceiling and pump it up and no CPI. Okay. And we also need to address <laughs> Citizens United. Ooh, All right. Ooh, team, team. Oh. <laughs> and I think you are the last person we haven't heard from. No, you heard from Yeah. Have yeah. yeah, we heard from Deb? You haven't heard, heard from her. her. Yeah, you kind of. Yeah, uh, she wanted. Did, I, did we get every, everybody? Everybody. Okay. She didn't want to talk to them. I wanted to listen. Yeah, well, we all, we're all kind of. So um, just think about how much has just come up in the room with a, a small group of us, right? But. Mm -hmm. In looking at, does it still matter, are there still issues at stake at the federal level or federal oh, government, I think just taking just the issues that came up here, they're profound. Um, they're really profound. And I think in some of these places we're fighting going backwards on things that we felt that we had progressed past uh, a ways before. And, um, you know, we started with just let's do something. I think what worries me is that policy making has been replaced with a type of political sportsmanship where there's two teams and we'd rather shut the whole thing down than let somebody else sort of score a goal or whatever. I'm probably not very good at making sports analogies, but um, when, even from the time I first started uh, at, at the state level, uh, it has been getting more and more challenging as far as finding a hand on the other side of the aisle when you reach across. And we have seen some cases where uh, when some Republicans have worked with us on different legislation, many of them have gone on to face primaries mm -hmm. um, or were penalized. Uh, we had some rural economic development measures that were put through this last year and, and had gotten some bipartisan support and when the Republican leadership in the Senate decided they wanted to kill the bill rather than let it pass, they substituted uh, committee members that day because a Republican had committed to vote on something that would have done uh, economic development in rural Colorado and uh, while they had committed on it, leadership didn't want it to pass and so they just simply made substitutions of who serves on committees. Um, the fact that these ideological battles are getting caught up in things like just, you know, whether or not we pay the bills on time and keep things shutting down. Um, I will tell you my concern is, is that for a generation of people coming up, they may not have seen it function in any other mm -hmm. way or know that it can right. or right. should function in another way. And um, Where senators had tea or coffee or supper with each other. I mean, and there really is, there is something to be said about the socializing. I mean, it's just, um, it's very important. Because once, it, the more you know each other as human beings, the easier it is to actually figure out what makes them tick. You start to humanize the people you're working with, understand what they care about, who they care about. Um, and so, right now, I think we are truly at a, at a critical crossroads federally mm -hmm. and you guys really brought it up. I mean, you heard it from yourselves, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's rights and liberties, whether it's economic opportunity for good paying jobs or for college or the cost of daycare. I mean, to me, for most families, as far as what's on their mind, do I have a good paying <coughs> job? 
Can I pay for childcare if I have it? Can my kids or grandkids afford to go to college? Can I have a secure retirement? And as far as the health issues that are brought up, do I have the ability or the power to make the choices for me and my family that are the right fit for, for me and my family? Uh, you had brought up the Death with Dignity Act uh, last year. I do suspect something will be coming back. Um, where there are some folks who probably will never support it, but there were some folks who thought that some of the definitions as far as whether there were enough protections for people who were sort of already at the point where they weren't able to express decisions for themselves. Um, I think it's Oregon. Um, you know, it's possible yeah. we wind up seeing it as an issue on the ballot. Um, someone else had brought up hospice care too, and um, curious what you, um, because I think you were wanting to see some reforms on hospice. 10 or 15 years ago, if you had a terminal illness and you didn't have the family infrastructure to be supported at home, you could go to an inpatient long-term yeah. facility and get, and that would be paid for. And so that had, it wasn't for everybody, obviously being in the home is the ideal situation, but because of fractured families and infrastructure, it's not always possible. Right. Currently, the only way you get to an inpatient hospice is if you're actively dying. Yeah. And that means, you know, hours to days before you die, that, that, there's a big gap there. Yeah, there I is said, a gap there. I said we, two in-laws died within the last year from cancer, and, you know, they stayed at home, they had the resources, one went into inpatient at the very end, but what we did with them clearly couldn't have been done by most families who didn't either have the family support or the financial <coughs> Right, or resources. medical professionals who happened to be who happened to be in the family. Um, I mean, I'm just curious, is there anyone who hasn't known someone who's gone through hospice care or hospice experience? I know, um, I mean, I think at this point, most of us have. I've been very glad for it as an option, because for me, when I, if it gets that far, hospice versus hospital for me is, I mean, I've been, you know, I think they do a lot to make hospice more, more comfortable, but, these really profound questions about life and death and infrastructure and jobs and options and quality and freedoms and then that's not a, that's before we even get into the whole world in which we live and what kind of relations do we want to have with our international neighbors. Um, you know, a lot of that's done at the executive and presidential level, but there is a role on Congress as far as looking at things both on trade policy, international human rights questions, you know, whether it's a culture of diplomacy first or last. Um, so I guess the importance of doing this is to realize it's profound, it's important, you caring matters, you being here matters, and this is very helpful to me uh, to get just starting conversations about the kind of things that are on your mind that you'd like to see improved because while they may not all happen overnight, they don't happen if you don't try. Um, yeah. so, and Dad, I saw your hand up. Um, if you could pick the committees that you Want. <laughs> which ones, which would you focus on? And I, I, almost a double question. I don't know that this is not time for this, but uh, the only the only thing in the years that Kaufman's been my representative that I've agreed with something he's done that I've known about is he had proposed several years ago to reduce the military budget. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you know any other good things about Kaufman. Or, what are you going to focus on? Well, um, God, there's a lot of questions for what's in there. Um, it's a problem. I start off somewhat uh, flexible on the committee uh, question because I do think it's possible to, to have to make have an impact on issues you care about, probably regardless of what committee. But that said, um, I think with Buckley Air Force Base. Um, the issue of the VA hospital that's out, there's no question that that's really key for veterans um, of all different ages. Um, I think that's very important for the district. Um, I think as far as foreign affairs go, um, the interesting thing about our district, um, and a lot of this is Aurora, but it's not only Aurora. Uh, we have way over 100 languages spoken. <laughs> and it is, the, the interesting thing about the microcosm is not just, uh, it's beyond a question of immigration policy. Um, when you learn about the kind of human rights challenges that people are facing around the world, there's always a story behind why someone gets here. 
And the strength of a district like this, and I was just uh, at a meeting last night and talking to some, uh, some guys that were from the South Sudan, and you see these um, truly ethnic cleansing, genocidal practices of what's happening, just the brutality of what was going on in South Sudan. And finally, you get together something that looks like a peace agreement. It starts to fall apart again, and people have loved ones in other parts of the world that are still in peril and in real deep trouble. And so I also think it may seem counterintuitive, but in order to represent a district like ours, I do think foreign relations <coughs> matter because we've got a whole community of people here locally that have ties all around the world. Um, and it really is a reminder of how connected we are and some of the things we take for granted. So I would have a really strong interest in that. I care a lot about health care issues. Um, judiciary um, w might be a good fit because obviously with the legal background, but it's where we did most of the sentencing reform issues at the state level too. And I will say that there's a federal role there too where we started to re-examine is incarceration the most productive result on the nonviolent offenders or offenders with mental illness? And slowly we began to readjust our sentencing, our sentencing structures, which freed up funds for mental health, substance abuse, and addiction and treatment. Mm -hmm. We honestly still have some more work there. But I think at one point those were so politicized that you think, hey, you can't do that without risking public safety. And what's interesting is that the data is in saying, when you look at what works, it's actually better on recidivism, it's better on crime pre prevention on the front end, uh, it's more humane, and it's also more cost effective. And we're just barely, we're, you know, we have more work to do at the federal level to really revisit how our uh, sentencing structure goes and when it's funding for that versus health care. Um, we do still have a mass, uh, sort of a, a, a mass of national. Um, substance abuse, addiction, and psychological issues that go very untreated. Mental health for developed countries, where we still have a long way to go on mental health stuff. And we tend to see the collapse at the tail end of what happens there. But there is a place, not only in research funding, um, you know, as we're looking at implementation on things like the Affordable Care Act, Mental health parity is still a long ways off. We still really do treat mental health very differently from mm -hmm. physical health and the systems, and there's a, a, a significant role there. So to me, I see so many different issues that I'm passionate about. I think I could probably find something that I would love to be doing truly on, on uh, almost any committee. I believe that. But the, <laughs> those are some of the ones that I think might be. Uh, and, and I just I bring up the health. Um, related stuff too because with Anschutz in the district with the hospital uh, structures we have uh, going on that are so important to our area not just as far as job creation but actual health policies um, I think that would be a really powerful uh, a powerful area to get into for there too so um, I think for the most part it's um, you know being, a, being interested in keeping an ear to the ground, um, taking a look at when there's opportunities to, uh, in the middle of everything that might seem depressing, there are these interesting left-right opportunities and we have had to find them at the state level too. Mm -hmm. So um, some of the sentencing reform we did um, was a bipartisan coalition. We've re looked at the issue of testing and over-testing in our public schools and we found a left-right coalition of people who wanted to free up more time for instruction uh, over testing. I think on college affordability and debt reform, I think there's an opportunity for some left-right coalitions on things like that, on sentencing reform. When we're looking at, you know, I can't understand the Republicans that still want to privatize Social Security, and I know Kaufman himself has referred to it as a Ponzi scheme, but the reality is, is Republicans and Democrats depend on Social Security. Mm -hmm. I can't yeah. imagine a bigger disaster for individuals or our national economy than depleting Social Security, but we just have to stay vigilant and not get too comfortable because I think we've seen once we think we've made progress and we breathe and we sort of let our guard down and suddenly we've got people that are trying to go backwards on voting rights or on even, you know, birth control or other things that we thought were, you know, sort of figured out for years ago. But um, 
this gives me a lot, and I guess I turn the floor back to you for any parting thoughts you have before uh, we give them their space. I, there's something, and we were we've been watching uh, the new Late Show with <coughs> what's his face, uh, what's Steve, 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 Steve Colbert, Steve Colbert. Steve Colbert. <laughs> Just because I said, oh, this is new, let's watch it. He had uh, Justice Breyer on the other night. Mm. Mm -hmm. And he's had some really interesting people on. He had Bernie Sanders last night, and he's going to have Cruz on tomorrow night or tonight. So he's just all over. But Justice Breyer, who was, you know, um, said that um, there are nine justices. They don't agree. He said, but we sit, nine of us, around in a table. And he said, there's never a harsh word. There's never name calling. There's <coughs> never a voice raised. He said we focus on the job at hand. There is still respect for each other. And that is what we've lost in our government, mm -hmm. yeah. is the respect for each other. And we have a lot more bullying. And we can see that if mm -hmm. anybody watched Oh, yeah. Any of the, you know, we, we sat there and watched the Republican debate the other night. Oh, she's a slut. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you really feel? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's just, there is, there's so many bullies out there. Sure. And they don't, they're looking at ways to, to you know, to um, start a fight. Not to find an answer to a problem. Yeah, and the discourse has gone... Way better. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I thought, we geez, have... if we could just get along the way yeah. the justices, who absolutely don't agree. You're right, yeah. they don't. You don't you know. believe the way I believe. You're the devil. I mean, we got to... <laughs> yeah. No compromises. So, you know, I just think that's the thing. No middle ground. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think if we look at history, and we go back to Adams and Jefferson in 1800, and see that there's been a continuum of rises and falls in the amity mm -hmm. between people in this country. No. The Civil War was obviously wow. the extreme yeah. example. Yeah. And I think if we're, you know, I, I admire your hope mm -hmm. for uh -huh. being able to work together. I think you should try it. But I'm sure you're not going to be surprised if it doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm working on thinking and getting thicker skin right now. <laughs> well, I think the conclusion that I'm hoping we'll end up with is being effective so that we don't have to depend upon them. And that's going to be a tough, long job yeah. mm -hmm. because of the gerrymandering of the House is so severe. Right. It's going to be a long time, I think, before we win that. Yeah. But you're going to have a lot of support, and um, I hope you make it. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Well, good night. I'm going to remain seated. I've adjusted to the high altitude. Um, <laughs> you hear, when you go to political meetings, you hear pretty much the same topic being discussed, and that's great. I don't get tired of hearing about it, particularly about Social Security, things like that. Yeah. We own the issue. Mm -hmm. We own them. Mm -hmm. Why in the world we play defense on it, I don't know. But there's one that might uh, might put you out in front of Mike Coffin. Something you can beat him over the head with. That is and, that, uh, <laughs> and, and that is something you don't hear much about, but I think it's very important. And that's the issue of regulations. Uh, the Republicans claim we're overregulated in this industry, in this country. Oh yeah, when I was 16 years old working in a cotton mill. People were dying left and right of brown, brown lung disease, or in the asbestos plant over next to us of asbestosis, or we were spraying our bugs with DDT. It killed the bugs and just about everything else. So the, the line, you know, the 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 uh, subject is endless with mm -hmm. examples, mm -hmm. but they still want us to roll back. We roll don't want back, that's what you hear from the Republicans all the time, roll back. Roll back to where and what will we have right. when we get there if we allow that to happen. We can't allow it to happen. We don't want we any cops on Wall Street. People. Mm -hmm. We are forward look. we can't do a thing about yesterday, okay? That's already happened. But we can plan and make tomorrow what we need it to be for our children. 
It ain't going to happen by osmosis, and it sure as heck isn't going to happen with the Republicans. By the way, the Cox brothers are spending millions in Georgia now. Are oh, they good? They'll be playing in this race. Maybe they'll stay out of Colorado. <laughs> for a moment, just quickly, I want to thank you for doing this. I don't know if anybody here has ever been able to find a Mike Kaufman town hall, but if you have, I mean, they're harder to find than a cockfight. But if you have, it's going on right now at Bemis Library. Well, all of the questions are scripted. You have to submit them in writing in advance, and a handler decides where you get to ask them. And even when he comes next door to the South Metro Chamber, where I'm the only Democrat in the audience, the questions still have to be submitted in writing to a handler. Now, I've known Mike Kaufman, and we're actually friends since legislative days into this very day we're friends. We can't agree if it's Saturday or Sunday, but we're friends. <laughs> he, I didn't write my question out. The handler said I couldn't ask it, but Mike called on me anyway. I appreciate you coming here even with a video um, going and not scripting the questions and answering them all. That's what representation is. That's Thank what you, we Us, and we'll see you more and uh, Hope to see you onward more. forward and <laughs> yep. onward and upward. <laughs> so for tonight, if you want to volunteer.